uh, we are back to uh, Acts chapter 5 and the story goes from verse 1 down through verse 11 we're going to read again uh, verse 4 and so you can see we've got a long ways to go uh, in walking through this passage and again we're going to be looking today at verse 3 and 4 specifically so here's the story But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Let's bow in prayer. Uh, We are absolutely bowing. In the depth of our inner being, we are bowing. The greatness of who you are has overwhelmed us, and we want to be consistently and constantly overwhelmed with that greatness. Lord, would you uh, speak to the depth of our heart? Would you give us an Acts chapter 4 verse 31 thing? Would you shake the place in which we are sitting? And would you fill us all with the Holy Spirit? And would you let us have an encounter and a personal involvement with you that we may have never experienced before? Would you take those of us who do have an experience and would you take us deeper and would you ingrain within us more than ever before? So we are here today to look into your word and to have you do something inside of us. We haven't just come. We've come for you to do something. We haven't just come to sit. We've come for you to speak to the depth of our hearts and don't leave me out, Jesus. So we offer ourselves to you today. Uh, for we need you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, down by Wilson County uh, Jail. Uh, that stoplight there. Uh, I pull up there, you know. And there's this car. It's pulled right here. And this guy is in this car. The windows are down. And, of course, the whole car is kind of vibrating. You know. And, and he's, I don't know, he's shaking his neck. And he's, he's, he's sitting. He's not standing. He's sitting in the car. And he's just shaking all over at the beat of this music. What does that tell you? He's not a musician. It tells you that God has put something in the inner being of every individual that responds to music, that responds to the beat of the drum that responds to rhythm that res- we, we've got something inside of us that responds to that and maybe you say well I don't sing there's still you crank that radio up brother you, <laughs> you just come on don't look at me like that come on you, you like that music I believe that at the heart of every religion is music. I believe there's something about being in a relationship with God that responds in 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 music, responds in rhythm, responds in excitement, responds in uh, in praise, responds in worship, and that at the heart of every kind of religious experience is an inner desire that says oh I just I I just got to express this I want to express this I need to express this that there's something within the human life that demands an expression of what's going on inside of them and one of the avenues strong avenues for that expression of course is this idea of music it's interesting that John Wesley who's the founder who was the founder Uh, back in the 1750s of the Methodist church with his brother Charles they wrote their belief their theology in hymns 
and they put them to the bar tunes, the local bar tunes of that hour. So everybody knew the tune. So on Sunday morning they'd be singing their theology because they knew they didn't listen. The congregation didn't listen to what they preached. The congregation did memorize the songs and got the theology in their head. And that music was a part of the core of the religious movement that shook all of England. And it was all about this inside thing, this music thing, this desire inside that said, I've got a, can you imagine thousands and thousands of Jewish Israelite men standing in the, sin, in the temple in Jerusalem, literally shoulder to shoulder and literally singing on the Sabbath day, chanting and singing about the greatness of their God. And you know what their hymn book was? The book of Psalms in the Old Testament. You read it all the time. It's the book of Psalms. That was their hymn book. And it was their expression, their inside expression of the greatness of their God. And they were constantly just praising Jehovah God and all that he was and all that he is and all that he's done and all he's going to do. The actual word psalm in the Hebrew means praise. So all the psalms have an element about them. Yes, of prayer. Yes, of desiring. Yes, of oh God intervene in my life. But every single one of them has this element of overwhelming praise to Almighty God that he is adequate for the hour. And the psalms are all about praise. Now they took the Psalms which was in the Hebrew language and translated it into the Greek language and in the Greek language the word Psalm means songs that should be accompanied with a stringed instrument which again is all about music and all about praise and all about there's 150 Psalms in their hymn book in the book of Psalms in the Old Testament 150 of them and they are divided into five sections and each section ends with a benediction in fact the whole book of Psalms ends with, ends with this one big benediction which is called a doxology and it's all about praise to God and what they were praising in the go through the book of Psalms what they were praising in the Psalms as they sang praises to God was all about his attributes that were contained and expressed in what he had done for them. In other words, they'd experienced things like deliverance out of Egypt land. They'd experienced like things like manna from the sky, and quail from the bush. They'd experienced deliverance from their enemies. They experienced all of those things. In the book of Psalms, they were praising, Oh God, you are great. Oh God, you are almighty. And it was worship and praise to Jehovah, their God, who had done all of these things in their lives. In fact, they praised his attributes. Which literally means qualities that he has. For instance, one of the qualities that they kept praising God for was a transcendency. Which means God is transcendent. He is above. He is beyond. He is, how do you explain this? He is independent. That he is otherness. That we have our world and we're all dependent on what's in our world. But he's not contained within our world. He is other than our world. And is not dependent upon our world. And they'd praise God. God you're above us. God you're beyond us. God you're transcendent. See God doesn't need oxygen to breathe. God doesn't need. If the universe has disappeared. Guess what? God wouldn't be out in the cold. He wouldn't go. Oh where am I going to stay tonight? See God. God doesn't have that problem. Because he is independent dependent of everything that's going on in our world because he is a transcendent above and beyond God and they praise God that you are beyond us you are bigger than we are and the Psalms are full of that absolutely full of that they praise God for the attribute of unchangeable think of this one unchangeable God is absolutely unchangeable meaning he doesn't change meaning He's the same today. In fact, we quote out of uh, one of the epistles. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He's always the same. He's always the same. 
Every time you meet him. He's, see you never get up in the morning and say. Oh I wonder if God will be mad today. See he's not mad. He wasn't mad yesterday. He's not going to get mad today. Why? He's always the same. There is a faithfulness about the sovereign God. There is a faithful, faithfulness about Jehovah. That he, he is steady and always the same. And he doesn't have bad days. And he doesn't get ticked off. And he isn't upset because he had four flat tires. He is the same every, every time you come to him. He's going to have the same attitude because he is that way. Let me read one of them to you. This is Psalms 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. God is faithful, unchangeable, transcendent. He's above us. Can you imagine a thousands and thousands of Israelite men standing shoulder to shoulder in the temple and all shouting that one psalm of the greatness of their God. Wow. That's worship. One of the other attributes that they sang a lot about was the idea that God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. They kept talking about the power and they demonstrated it of course. Saw it demonstrated in the activities that God did for them. So they were always singing about their deliverances. See all the feast days revolved around the deliverances that God brought to their life. Why? Because he's powerful. There's nothing beyond him. It isn't that he has power. It is that he is power. It isn't that he's the, he's, he's the strong man of the universe. He's, he's way beyond that. Because the essence of power revives with, abides within his being. And this sovereign God of ours. He is literally the powerful one. And there is nobody that matches him even closely. Listen to this psalm. He counts the number of stars. He calls them by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing towards the sons of men. He turns the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Woo! That's our God. That's our God. And again, can you imagine shoulder by shoulder, thousands of Israelite men standing together saying, Oh, God, you are absolutely transcendent. You are above us. You are absolutely unchangeable. You are so faithful. You're always the same. And you are the strong strength of the universe. You are the powerful, omnipotent, almighty, sovereign God. We praise you. That's what they did. Every Sabbath day. Oh, there's this attribute of omniscience, all knowing. They sang about that all the time. Well, you have to. Because, God, you know it all. There's nothing beyond your knowledge. It isn't that God has discovered information, it isn't that God investigated and learned a lot of things it's that somehow contained within the essence of God he has literally produced all knowledge see when we say Jesus is the truth we're not talking he's really smart we're not talking well he really went to school and learned a lot we're not talking well he's literally has a big high IQ see we're not talking that we're talking that truth somehow is what he has brought into he invented it this guy by the name of Newton was sitting under a tree and an apple fell and hit him on the head. And suddenly it dawned on him. Oh, gravity. Apples don't fall up. They fall down. And he discovered gravity. But he didn't invent it. Our God invented it! See, our God caused it. And the reason he knows about gravity is because he put it into existence. So all knowledge he has literally brought out of his own brain cells has literally been produced out of his own heart. He has complete absolute knowledge. In fact, he has complete absolute knowledge about, this is scary, you. 
Psalms 139. You know what it says in Psalms 139. It says, God was back before my mother's womb, pouring my substance together, putting and mixing me up. Got to have some of that. Got to have some of this. And he put me together back before my mother's womb. Even before I was, he knew my ways. He knew my going down. He knew my getting up. Back before I was. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's got it down. He knows you inside and out. Come on. Number of hairs on your head as they fall out. He's got you down. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the inner motives of your heart, the inner thoughts of your being. He is omniscient, all-knowing. God, can you imagine Israelite men, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of them, literally standing shoulder by shoulder in the temple on the Sabbath day, singing about the great attributes of our God. Our God is transcendent. He's above everything that is. Our God is unchangeable. He is faithful. Our God is omnipotent. He's the strong one of the universes. He's our powerful, almighty, sovereign God. Our God is all-knowing, and he knows the depth of of everything that is. That's our God. And they sang about it. Our God. In fact, Psalms 150, the final climactic psalm, it's a doxology. It's the close of their hymn book. It says this, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of a trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with the tremble and the dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise Him with the loud cymbals. Praise Him with the clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Woo! That was their final hymn. <laughs> For our God is transcendent. Our God is unchanging. Our God is omnipotent, all strength. Our God is omniscient, all knowing. That's our God. Praise Him. Ananias and Sapphira. This is the only place in the whole Bible we find them. These 11 verses. They got one shot at this. 11 verses. We don't know of anything of them before. We don't know anything about afterwards. Just these 11 verses. We would assume some things. Number one, we would, we would assume that they are consecrated Jews. They live in Jerusalem. They're Israelite people. They're Jews. They don't live in the foreign land. They don't come and visit. They, they have decided we're going to be at the heart of, of Israel. Israel religion, Israel movement. We're going to be in the middle of this. We want to be close to the temple. They observe the feast days. They go every Sabbath day to the temple. Can you see Ananias in this great, great big group of men? He's standing shoulder to shoulder with them. And he's singing at the top of his lungs these great psalms about their almighty God. And he believes that with his whole heart. He is a consecrated Jew. He has offered the sacrifices. He's trained his kids if he has any. He's trained he, he has learned as a child all the way up the great truths of Israel by the time he was 12 he had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament this boy knows the stories this guy knows the information this guy believes in the facts this guy believes in sovereign God this guy believes in Jehovah this guy rejoices Ananias he rejoices in praising the Almighty God he believes that a God who indeed is transcendent who is deed is unjust changing whose deed is all powerful almighty who is also all knowing he believes in that he's a consecrated Jew he's not only a consecrated Jew he's a converted Christian a converted Jew now we don't know when his conversion took place but he's a part of the early church and man you didn't mess with that you didn't accidentally become a part of the early church You didn't just show up on Sunday once in a while. See, he was a converted Jew. Living in Jerusalem, he probably heard Jesus preach. 
Although Jesus spent most of his time in Galilee. So hey. And Ananias and Sapphira were, had some wealth. At least they had some possessions. And the people that followed Jesus around in the crowds, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, those people, they were handicapped folks. They were the poor. They were the cast out. They were the, that, that group. So Ananias probably wasn't in on that. But he had heard about Jesus. There's no question about that. In fact, he probably, we don't know, but he probably was involved in the actual crucifixion of Jesus. He probably was in the crowd. Him and, and, and Sapphira, they were probably in the crowd. Shaking their fists, yelling and screaming. They probably were a part of the crucifixion. Wiped their hands with the leaders of Israel. Say, whoa, he's dead. We took care of that. But see, something happened to them. Hey, they keep going to the temple all the time. Again, they're consecrated Jews, so they're in the temple. And then Pentecost took place. Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Then he poured the Spirit out. And here's 120 that have just been filled with the Spirit. And it's all happening in the temple. And Ananias and Sapphira may have been there at that very time. And saw the filling of the Spirit, the outpouring, the dream of God being fulfilled. And they said, what on earth is going on? And Peter stood up and began to preach. And in that sermon, the Spirit of God began to move. And Ananias and Sapphira would have gotten under conviction and no question about it they, in fact the crowd said what shall we do the Bible says they were cut to the heart that conviction set in and they said oh my stars what have we done here and Peter stood up and said hey there's only one thing to do you crucified him now uncrucify him you nailed him now unnail him hey you rejected him now accept him hey you shook your fist in his face now you embrace him and so Ananias the fire knelt sometime knelt and said oh Jesus we're sorry we recognize you as the Messiah come into our life and they were literally receptions received the very essence of the spirit of God in their lives and became converted Jews they were burning in the early church listen they were a part of the apostles teaching come on they were in on when the Holy Spirit hit that place in chapter 4 verse 31 and the place was shaken they were there they experienced the miracles and the healings and the signs and the wonders and wow isn't our God great that's this these guys these guys they experienced all of that hey they're in on this they are right there they are they're not only consecrated Jews converted Jews they're contributing Jews they are so wrapped up in this they say hey let's sell our property too Whoa. let's sell our property and give to the church we want to be a part of what God is doing we want to be a part of ministry we don't know what they did in ministry in the early church maybe they taught a class maybe they were just helping whatever they were doing they wanted to be a part of this they sold land for the purpose of being generous to the church that's that suddenly everything is backwards see every, everything is turned upside down suddenly in the story everything is in chaos generosity has turned to selfishness truth has turned to deception and lies what's going on why Ananias Suddenly commitment has turned to compromise. Suddenly Jesus. Now we're into Satan. Satan has filled your heart. What? What? Ananias. What's going on with you? Why? And he asks the question. See that's the heart of the passage. The, the four questions. Peter answered and said. Ananias. Why has Satan filled your heart? Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Why did you keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Down at verse 4. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Why? Ananias, what on earth happened? A man who stands in the temple, shoulder to shoulder with thousands of Israelite men, and sings about the greatness of their God, who experienced the very indwelling greatness of that God within, who knows the absolute knowledge of God, who has experienced the all-knowing power of God, and you, what are, Ananias, what, why? Number one, attribute 
Now again, I want you to get this. Sabbath after Sabbath, not one or two. Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. Year after year, Ananias stands with thousands. Can you see him? His chest is all puffed out, man. His shoulders are back. His head is high. And he's singing at the top of his lungs. The Old Testament Psalms, the greatness of our God, our God who is omniscient, our God who knows all, our God who is everlasting, our God who's all powerful, our God who has complete knowledge, our God, our God. He sings that. And now what is he doing? Lying to God. Come on, think. Do you see the stupidity of that? You know what the Bible says? Isaiah. Isaiah says, come on, man. Come on. Come on in here. Sit down at the table. Come, let us reason together. Don't put your brain aside. Don't just feel your way into this. Come on, logically sit down and discuss this with me. On the one hand, you've got an om omniscient God who knows everything. And you want to try to lie to him? <laughs> How are you going to lie to somebody who knows everything? You're going to try to hide Something from a God who sees all? Duh. See, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Ananias, what happened to you? What's going on in your life? Out of this side of your mouth, you're saying, oh God, you know everything. Out of this side of your mouth, you're saying, I'll deceive him. I'll cover up. He'll never get all of this. You've been lying to God. What? 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 Don't you see the overwhelming stupidity? Come, come on, come on. Sit in, get in here. Sit at this table. Look me in the eye, God says. Come on, let's think it through. Reason out, reason it out. Don't you see the stupidity of that, Ananias? That you could lie to God? Don't you see the impossibility of that? Don't you see how ridiculous that is? Don't you see that can't be done? In fact, Ananias, you have received the revelation of Jesus in your life. Think of this. The revelation of Jesus has come. You have literally done what we call merger. You have literally merged with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of this all-knowing God has literally come and indwelt you and literally merged with you, your mind and his mind. So when you think a thought, he's in on that thought. He knows you inside and out. And you're going to try to Pull the wool over his eyes. You're going to try to cover. You're going to try to con. You're going to try to act one way and be another and hope he doesn't know. <laughs> what are you doing, Ananias? Don't you see the stupidity of that? How ridiculous that is? You can't pull that off. In fact, talk to Peter. Three years of intimacy with Jesus. Three years of being a part of ministry. Three years of being a disciple. Three years of being filled and having the, sp the power of Jesus within to go out and do miracles and to, and, and to do, and to do uh, signs and wonders and to do ministry. Three years of involvement. Three years of sitting on the front row. Three years of being in, the, in on the Sermon on the Mount. Three solid years of this. Three years he knows Jesus. And when Jesus comes to say, guys, here's how it's all going to go down. Hey, I'm going to die on a cross. You know what Peter does? Takes him aside and says, Jesus, you're wrong on this one. When it comes to a garden of Gethsemane, he grabs a, he grabs a dagger and starts in like, like, if the war depended on him, we'd never, he can't, he misses and cuts the guy's ear off. What? Peter, what are you doing? After all the knowledge and all the insight and all you've been, what, what? Are, come on, Peter, get in here. Sit down, Peter. Look me in the eye, God says. Hey, don't you see the stupidity of this? The 
But you understand that all sin is stupidity. It makes no sense. That logically, if you were thinking it through, I wouldn't do it. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind, minds the God of this age has blinded. See, the only way I can participate in lying to God is to somehow talk myself in, be blinded to, not see the reality of the fact that he is omniscient. Because if there is an omniscient God lying to someone who knows everything, doesn't make any sense. So you've got this attribute thing. Guys, if God is really like this, if we really believe what we believe about him, what should be my response? Well, manly, what's the problem then? What, what's the problem? In the ans- what's the answer to the question why? Well, let's go from attribute. Let's go to attitude. See, Ananias has developed an attitude. It's not about the deed. Come on, how many times have we said this to you? It's not about that. Well, he lied. It's not about lying. Well, I'll quit lying. That'll straighten it all out. Oh, it won't. Because it isn't about lying. Well, it's about the money. That's it. He kept back the money. It isn't about the money. What's it about? It's about the attitude. See, Ananias has developed an attitude. It's the attitude. You know that he had just experienced... In the, in the book of Acts chapter 4 which is just, just before this and in the context of all of this they had just experienced persecution this just blows me away Peter and John have been called in before the Sanhedrin and they are literally threatened to the inch of their lives if you talk about Jesus anymore uh, we're going to kill you all and so they come back to the early church and say hey we're all going to die if we stay with this we're all going to die and you know what the early church did they all bound together and said whoo bring it on hey we're going to stay said fast if they could do that to Jesus we'll, we, we would be glad to be in that pattern so whatever they did to Jesus we'll be welcome if they did that to us if they crucified him they can crucify us if he suffered we'll be willing to suffer for the same and they aligned themselves in fact it increased in their lives in fact it says in chapter 4 verse 31 and when they had prayed the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness they had, Ananias was right in the middle of that Ananias and Sapphira were right in the middle of that shaking and that commitment and we're all in and this is, this is our deal and they aligned themselves with that what happened What took place? What happened within the inner being? See, it wasn't an activity. Do you get that? It wasn't an activity. It wasn't, oh my, look what I did. Well, that fixed that. No, it wasn't the activity. It was that somehow within them, there was a growing attitude that began to take place in the depth of their lives. And somehow, Ananias began to think, I can take care of myself better than God can. I can handle this better than he can. I know more than he knows. And an attitude began to develop and where he began to trust himself more than he trusted God. Oh, brother. Do you know that every time I live in depression, 
I allow depression to fill my life? It's because I've got this attitude. I'm trusting myself rather than you. And if all I've got myself, why, if all I have is myself, why wouldn't I be depressed? You tell me how you're going to be filled with an almighty God. You tell me how you're going to be all wrapped up in a God who is transcendent. A God who is unchangeable. A God who is omnip uh, omnipotent, all powerful. A God who is all knowing. Who absolutely has a plan and is working all things out for his glory and your benefit. You tell me how you're going to dwell in that and be depressed. Do you realize every time my life is filled with anxiety? It has to be because of this, this, this attitude. That hey God you're not adequate for this. And I got to count on myself. And if I have to count on myself no wonder I'm filled with anxiety. Because how are you going to know in the depth of your life that God is an absolute he is transcended above all things he is absolutely faithful and totally unchangeable and that he is the same today yesterday and forever that he is the one who is absolutely all powerful and he is the one who knows all things and is planned according to those all things that you have that kind of God who is, you can align your life with how are you going to be filled with anxiety and live in that kind of wonder Do, do you realize every time I'm stressed out? Oh man, what am I going to do? Do you realize that every time I lose my temper and anger just fills me? You know what I've done? I've moved from to See, this, this is not hard to explain because I've been there so many times myself. Do you realize that when you trust, when I trust myself instead of him, I've literally, I've literally, I've literally slapped him in the face. I've literally said, you're not adequate. Do you realize, Ananias, when you lied to the Holy Spirit, you literally laughed in his face and said you aren't as smart as I thought you were you don't know what I thought you knew you literally degraded demeaned and belittled God himself come on man here's the table come on here and here God said come on in here sit down let's think this thing through hey let, let's, let's go over it let's reason together hey don't put your mind aside think this thing through who am I and who are you and what should be your relationship with me? See, that, that's his message here. Well, if God has these attributes and Ananias has this attitude, what is the attitude? Well, it's arrogance. Do you realize that the heart of every single sin is an arrogance that says, I know better than him that I'm in charge and he's not and that that is the it isn't about the deed it's about that attitude it's about that kind of arrogance that stands in the face of God Ananias man you stand among the Israelite men shoulder to shoulder you stick out your chest you raise your head you sing the great psalms you sing about his how he's transcended you sing how he is literally unchanging you sing how he is omni, omnipotent all powerful and how he's omniscient all knowing and, and you turn around and lie what are you doing Jesus
Wouldn't it be something, Jesus, if we really believed what we believe? Wouldn't it be something if I jumped in with both feet and what I really believe about you, I really went all out and committed myself to that and I allowed it to be the basic, fundamental, driving passion and focus of my life. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something of what I've learned all my life and experienced from you consistently and constantly that you are love and that you're constantly working in my behalf and that you're redemptive and you're forgiving and you want to involve yourself within me and you want to work in my life and you've got the, you've got, you want to enhance me and you want to merge with me and you want to bring about the best in and through me. I've learned that all my life. I've heard that all my life. I say I believe it. Wouldn't it be something if I would absolutely kick my feet out from under me and just fall in that and just let that support me totally and absolutely and live in the wonder of who you are? Forgive us, oh God, in the midst of our arrogance when we've handled it on our own when you wanted to literally move through us to do what we couldn't do. Forgive us, oh God, when we've manipulated our own circumstances, when we should have trusted you. Forgive us, oh God, when we had to rile out, we had to rile up, we had to get mad, we had to, we had to become angry, we had to, we had to exert all we felt, we had to, when we should have been feeling like you feel. Forgive us, O oh God, in our stupidity. When we've tried to lie to a one who knows everything. And have you called us this morning to the table? Let's reason it out. Put some logic to it. Think it through. And could we come to any other conclusion except I must, I must be totally yours. I must, I must give myself absolutely. I must, I must, I must, I must jump in with my whole being. I must abandon myself to all that you are. I must trust you over myself. Jesus, save me from myself. And the arrogant blindness of my own being. That I might be yours. Heads are bowed. Hey, no psychological manipulation. No emotional tug. No play on your emotions. Just, hey, think it through. And do a reasonable thing. Do you see the absolute stupidity of lying to a God who knows everything? The table is set. The altar is open. What kind of response can you make? If God is who He says He is, 
and if everything we've experienced about him can I do anything less than totally absolutely be his trust him could you offer him anything less than that today moments of seeking want to join me